right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to welcome Karen Curry Parker, who is in Wisconsin today. How are you doing, Karen? I'm good, John. Thank you. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic. And Karen is a number one best-selling author, human design specialist, trainer, professional speaker, and creator of quantum human design and quantum alignment systems, high-performance life coach. You've coached over 10,000 uh, people and taught so many more. And what we're going to talk about today is the hidden causes of burnout. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so Karen, let, let's get let's get straight into it, right? Most people think, uh, you know, most people think burnout is this huge, like dramatic thing that suddenly happens and, you know, people are like, ah, I'm, I'm burnt out. And it's, and it's like a, it's a dramatic kind of culmination event or something, but it's, it's really, I think a, a, a slow, steady burn, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I like that as a, I mean, I don't like that, but that's a great way of, yeah. <laughs> it is mm -hmm. definitely a, a slow, steady burn. It, and it's often not physical. And I think that's part of what we oftentimes miss is that sometimes it can be emotional. Sometimes it can be motivational, that sometimes, you know, if you're procrastinating, putting things off, if you're spending a lot of times on Netflix, eating Cheetos and just trying to survive your life, that, those are actually also symptoms of burnout. Yeah, no, that's a that's a that's a great point because uh, you know sometimes we do sort of think that it's just like it's a physical manifestation, like I'm exhausted, I'm burnt out. Um, but talk to me a little bit more about then the uh, as you said, I mean, there's emotional burnout, there's um, communication, there's so many different forms of it. Could you just talk in a little more detail about those? Well, I mean, so here's here's how I would describe it: if you're waking mm -hmm. up in the morning for your work day and you're not excited to get out of bed you're and, and that's not on a daily basis but you know sure. consistently over a baseline period of time if you're not excited about your life you're probably burned out and part of what and, and as i said part of that is the symptoms are going to be avoiding procrastinating oftentimes we hide burnout with not making good healthy choices for the care of our bodies it starts to take its toll on our relationships we we start to project onto our partners that they should be doing all the work or they should be rescuing us or that somehow they should be giving us a break and oftentimes we fail to really recognize that part of what's going on is that we're in a completely compromised position in every area of our life because we're not living in alignment with what's really good and right for us and who we really are yeah, no, that's a great point. And I, I like that thing about um, not living in alignment. So what are some of the ways that you can start to maybe at early warning signs that you're starting to head down this road of, of burnout? You know, the, the, the early warning signs are probably so prevalent that it's terrifying, but let's talk about it. I would say mm -hmm. the very first thing that I see these days with burnout is you start to get addicted to devices. You you can't have dinner without your phone. You can't spend a day without your phone, God forbid, a day without phone, computer. We oftentimes are using media as a substitute for really cultivating true meaning and alignment. And you know, if, if you're not able to, here's the trick. I would just say this, if you can't sit for two hours, we'll push the limits a little bit. If you can't sit for two hours without contact with a device, there's a pretty high probability that you're probably burned out. Yeah, you know that's a, that's a that's a great point um, because I mean, and 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 you would know probably better than I, but the studies that have been done nowadays about the dopamine hits from, and especially with kids, I mean, some of them get uh, get physically anxious if they don't get the dopamine hit of scrolling and you know, whatever on on TikTok or whatever that whatever it is that they scroll on. <laughs> You know, I think the piece that's really important to understand is that our lives are supposed to give us dopamine hits. We need dopamine mm -hmm. hits, but we're not supposed to be getting them mechanically. We're supposed to be getting a dopamine hit from challenging ourselves, from pushing the boundaries of what we think is possible, from contributing something meaningful in, mm -hmm. in life, life, for doing work that really 
soothes our soul and inspires us. And it might not even be that your job is necessarily going to be the source of passion, but that sure. it becomes a revenue stream or so, a support system so that you can then go home and do that thing that you're passionate about. And, you know, the disconnect, really the disconnect, we, we want to point it to work. We want to say, oh, that's not possible. We have to do what we have to do with money. We, you know, we, we lump all of that into this category. And even the World Health Organization, which actually classifies burnout as a medical diagnosis, says that burnout happens when you're not paid enough, you're overworked, the work conditions aren't safe or favorable. And I'm going to say, of course, those are going to contribute to burnout for sure. sure. If you're, but but there's more than that, because a lot of us are not working crappy jobs. A lot of us are working jobs that are well paying. But I think that conversation is also controversial these days. I mean, I certainly I would say probably younger generations are struggling with that because our, our wage structure here in the United States, at least, is probably not it is definitely not um, going to support people being able to live well. But there are people who have really great jobs who also burn out and that burnout isn't necessarily because your work situation is terrible. That burnout is because somewhere along the way, and this might even be before you started working, you lost connection with your purpose in the world or a sense of meaning about your purpose in the world. Mm. And you internalize the message that it's not okay for you to be who you are and how you are. And when we internalize that message and then consequently put ourselves in situations where those that message gets reinforced over and over again, the boss, the clients, the whatever the situation is, when you're constantly living in this state where you don't feel like you can be who you are and you can't be how you are and, and you learn to cover up who you are and how you are, it takes so much energy for us to be something we're not. It takes more energy to hold up the facade than it does to live true to who you really are. So I, I think of it as like, I, I, you know, if you go to one of those masquerade parties where you hold up the mask on a stick, mm -hmm. you know, you're not going to hold that thing up all night long. Uh, you know, <laughs> half a drink in, you're going to be taking the mask out. <laughs> you're going to get a cramp in your arm, right? You can't carry your you know, that, that around. And even though, that is technically a very lightweight thing. It's not heavy to hold up that mask. It still takes energy to hold it up. And when we live sort of misaligned with our own value, when we lose connection with our right place in the world, what we're here to do, who we're here to be, it's the same amount of effort that it takes to hold up that really lightweight mask. Every day, it's not a whole lot of effort, but over time, we get really exhausted trying to be someone we're not. And that means anytime you're saying yes, when you want to say no, anytime you say no, when you want to say yes, when you're making a commitment that you don't really want to make, when you feel stuck or locked or into a situation that you feel like you have no power over that you can't change, that experience on the daily basis contributes to burnout. And you're absolutely right. It's slow. It happens. It creeps up. We internalize it into culturally sanctioned you know, habits like getting on the internet and binge watching a show or, you know, and, and oftentimes overeating, failing to rest properly, failing to nurture ourselves. It starts to create this entire domino over time of actions and habits and patterns that eventually do lead to, in a lot of cases, massive collapse. Yeah, you know, that, you know, that those are fantastic insights. And I mean, and I think also what you were just saying there about the um, you know, the purpose, I mean, because I don't think enough people actually f sit down and trying to figure out their purpose and, and what really makes them, you know, feel worthwhile and, and all that. And unfortunately, now, as you said, with the device addiction, the world seems to be constructed in such a way as that we are discouraged from spending any time with our thoughts. And, mm. and how are we going to figure out what our purpose is or what's really going on if we can't spend any time with our own thoughts? Yeah, I think that's a, you know, that's, that's a good question. And I, you know, I, we're looking at a culture where anxiety is in it at, at record levels. And I, mm. I have questions about how much of that anxiety isn't actually justified. And, and I'm not saying we should be all, creating from a place of anx anxiousness, mm -hmm. but that something is happening that our internal signals about rightness and, and meaning are clearly sending a large, a large number of us a signal that's saying, Hey, you're not okay. It's not okay. We're not okay. 
and we don't we feel like we don't have options and i think that sense of powerlessness is is also contributing to that piece because we've forgotten well we've forgotten how to create options or we feel like there are no options available to us and the the you know the answer to what makes meaning or what are the options you know i would honestly say that i think there's a lot of question marks about that question the answer to that question i you know i think there are a lot of people especially right now really prognosticating about what's next and where we're headed with the economy mm -hmm. global warming I'm not saying that those aren't also very important questions. I think they are. But I think before we can answer those questions or before we can start preparing for what's next, I think what we have to first do is find the due north of how we're going to create and where we're going to create towards or what we're going to create towards. And part of that is getting back in touch with why am I here? Who am I and why am I here? Because if we don't have a due north as part, you know, as part of how we engineer our way forward, we're not going to be able to vet the opportunities or the circumstances that come at us to know what's right and what's not. And we're going to end up continuing to make, you know, reactive based, sometimes trauma based mm -hmm. choices instead of being able to consciously and deliberately slow down enough to say, OK, who am I? What am I here to do in the world? All this stimulus is coming at me, all these opportunities, possibilities, information, all of this is coming at me which of these things coming at me are the things that I need to pay attention to so that I can stay in my lane and continue to build towards the fulfillment of who I am and what I'm here to do. That feels like a luxury. I think for many of us, we're trained. That's a luxury. That's something you do later when you retire. You do your work when you're young and later on when you have time, you take care of that piece. And I think what I really want people to understand is I don't think you have time to put that off until later. Because the cost and the toll that that takes over time, you know, oftentimes makes it challenging for you to get to that later because the, the, the impact of burnout on not just your spirit and the joy you mm -hmm. have in your life, the toll that it takes on the physical form when you're living in a constant state of low grade elevated cortisol, not only does it, of course, tank your creativity and your ability to show up fully and be able to harness the solutions, find the solutions to the challenges facing humanity, it also takes a toll on your immune system, takes a toll on your structural system. It wrecks your health. You know, burnout costs the United States billions of dollars a year, literally billions of dollars a year. And, you know, if we don't tackle this really costly issue and recognize the cost that this issue is, 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 is costing businesses, we don't really start looking at how do we create workplaces and a way of, of creating in the world that's aligned with purpose and meaning, we're not only going to lose, you know, generation of workforce. I think we're already losing the millennial workforce. You know, we're not going to be able to find the creative solutions to fix what needs to be fixed on the planet right now. Yeah, no, I, I'm absolutely, and I agree. And there's so many things that you just said there that I just want to pick a, pick a few of them. Um, one of the things that you said there is I do feel that sometimes, and maybe it's a generational thing, uh, you know, that maybe people of our generation, my generation or whatever, I mean, maybe there's a feeling sometimes that we are in this world, we're not of this world, we're kind of being swept along by it. Um uh, and I think it's a very it's a it's a very difficult place at, at times because there's there's so much that we're we're kind of one foot in one foot out and we're not sure and we're trying desperately to be part of what just seems like a a, a raging torrent. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree that I think that it definitely feels that way right now. And and um, you know I have I have eight children. Seven of them are in their twenties mm. and thirties. And I would certainly say my children would very much embody that, you know, a couple of them at various levels, embody that sense of hopelessness. Of what, what is the point? The world, you know, I think one of my daughters tells me I have, we have 28 years. And so she says, I'm not going to have kids. I'm not going to get married. What's the point? Right. And so, you know, I think there is a certain need, if you will, to call back in for us collectively, ourselves collectively. Mm -hmm a path of empowerment, you know, are we, is, is it seem like there's a lot of destabilization and uh, what I would call a systematic, you know, dynamic systematic flux on the planet right now? Absolutely. But to just throw your hands up and despair and say, well, there's no hope, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to get 
people who feel so hopeless back in touch with a sense of empowerment. But I certainly would say that reconnecting with a sense of meaning does oftentimes inspire people um, with a sense of, of hope and purpose and action. You know, I, I, since COVID, I've been reading Victor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning, probably on repeat. Uh, yeah. You know, and I keep thinking about how if if someone who, you know, who yeah. is a, in a concentration camp can cultivate yeah. a sense of purpose and survive and continue to bring that sense of purpose out into the world, then certainly, you know, I think there's a there's an important question there for all of us to explore about, you know, our what are we casting a vote for in the future if we're abdicating our our hope? and our sense of empowerment. Yeah, and, and I also think, and Viktor Frankl, I, I'm glad you raised, uh, you brought him up, what a fantastic, um, and, and people should read up on that because as you said, I mean, for him to be able to suffer through the concentration camps and still be able to, to find purpose, you know, should you know, put us all to shame in many ways, to be honest, <laughs> if we can't. Um, but but here's the, here's, the, here's the point is I think uh, technology, social media, and everything. I think people get so wrapped up in these global issues, right? Or the news cycles or everything like that. I, I think there's a real need for people to pull themselves back a bit and start to look at what impact are they having on the on the community around them, like on your on your your spouse, your significant other, your 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 children, whatever. If you could focus on that for a for a time and find you know real purpose there i i think the world would be a better place because i think being so fixated on these big global issues or new cycles and raging on social media it's so self-destructive and it's not really contributing anything at all in fact i would say it's the opposite well i think when you look at you know some of the some of the more interesting research coming out about influence versus power that mm -hmm. Part of what we see is that when we stay in a state of, of heart coherence, which means our body and our heart and our minds are operating together, it's a measurable phenomenon. It's, you know, you can you can strap EKG monitors onto people and all kinds of other metrics and see whether somebody's actually in a state of coherence. That state of coherence is an entraining state. You can walk into a space where there's chaos. And if you're in this state of being aligned and in this state of heart coherence, you actually can entrain the energy and the hearts in the room, literally the hearts in the room. This is why, you know, in, in some indigenous cultures, you know, they use drumming as, as a way of, you know, holding the tribe together where the drum repeats or mimics a maternal heartbeat. And that heartbeat actually entrains everybody's hearts to be together. So when you're, feeling powerless and you think, oh, there's nothing I can do. Well, sometimes the first thing to do is to be in that coherent state and that that state itself can start to influence the environment. And when we influence the environment, basically what we do is we shift what's going on between stimulus and response. And so when you walk into a room and you're feeling freaked out and panicked and powerless, you know, the, the, what goes in that gap between stimulus and response is basically freak out. And then we go into reactivity, which is, I think really con honestly, where most of the planet is right now, we're mm -hmm. all reacting to this, these, these overwhelming stimuli. But if you walk in, in an entrained state and you bring that entrainment to the room where you're bringing literally coherence to the room, all of a sudden, what goes in that gap between stimulus and response changes. And now you can come from not only a more creative space, but also a more deliberate space. And in a more deliberate space, you can start vetting the stimuli and saying, okay, here's our purpose. Here's our intention. Here's our goal, mine and ours together. And in this entrained state now, instead of reacting because I'm panicking, I can now look at the stimulus and say, oh, well, here are the opportunities and here are the possibilities that match the intention, the goals, the, the purpose of where we are. And then we can start crafting individually and collectively movement towards those purposes. I'm not saying that staying in a well-aligned and, you know, happy, heart-based, love and light kind of a state is the only step. You know, I think there are a lot of people who right now who are really bemoaning love and light, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. but, but to stay in that state, that coherent state is a very important first step to creating deliberately and to, again, staying in alignment with creative solutions. 
We can't downplay the importance of our influence on a room when we walk in in a stable place. And, and, and I think if we, can, if we can redefine power and start thinking of power as being influence and stop thinking that there's something we have to do and start first with, well, maybe it's not what I do, it's how I be. And recognizing yeah. that how I influences the room, influences my community. Mike, if I can bring my community into an entrained state, then my community can influence the next tier up and the next tier up and the next tier up. There's just one other last piece I want to add, John, because I think this is a really fascinating bit of mm-hmm. research that come out of the Institute yeah. for Math. One of the things that they are looking at, and they have some really interesting, significant research coming out, is that when you have large collective groups of people who are in a coherent state, meaning they're on purpose, they feel aligned, they're at peace, if you have these gatherings of people deliberately coming together in this state, it actually influences the geomagnetic alignment. I mean, the geomagnetic forces in the atmosphere. So they, what they've done is they've actually brought people together, purposely asked them to get into this very conscious entrained state. And then they've measured atmospheric, uh, atmospheric qualities in the areas where they've had these clusters of people in these heart coherent states, and it actually changes the atmosphere. So when we fall into this powerless idea of there's nothing I can do, well, if you can be in a state that not only helps other people be more creative and deliberate, but actually starts to change the physical environment of the planet, you know, there's always something you can do. You can always get yourself into an entrained state. You might not have the, you know, the policy solutions yet, but if more, more and more of us are moving towards a critical mass of staying in that focused, directed, you know, purpose oriented space, you know, I think eventually we'll hit a critical mass where we'll all be empowered to make change. Yeah, and I, and I think that's a I think that's a that's a such a great point uh, because even even down to the fundamentals of, um, you know, when people rant and rave at each other on on social media and like scream at each other, you're stupid, your ideas are stupid, and whatever. And I always think like nobody ever changed anybody's mind by shouting at them and calling them stupid, mm-hmm. right? You. You add to what you say, you influence people by how you model, you know, the behavior you model, the way you show up and all of that. And to your point, I think if if more people focused on that and less on the ranting and raving, we might be able to achieve that 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 positive impact. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, just bringing it back to to purpose and burnout, you know, when you're in that purpose driven place, when you're connected to what I'll call the true story of who you are and you really understand the nuances of how you operate in the world. What do you need? What grounds you? What drives you? When you have that piece in place, then your ability to be able to work with the stimulus that comes at you, to vet it carefully, to look at the situations, to really be clear about which ones are for me and which ones do I need to just let roll by, the, you know, your, the amount of energy that you use building towards what you want versus, you know, hi- hiding or covering up and trying to be something you're not is exponential. It's much easier to create from that place. And you have much more power and influence from that place than from when you're trying to be something you're not or pretend to be something that you're not. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, uh, you know, pretending to be what you're not, it's, 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 it's got to be exhausting in the long run. I mean, I think we've probably all been guilty of it at different periods of our lives and uh, understand, but it's exhausting in the long run. It's much, uh, it's much easier being ourselves at the end of the day. <laughs> yes, for sure. For sure. <laughs> yeah. What is it? Oscar Wilde? Was it Oscar Wilde who said, like, you know, you, you're better off uh, being yourself because everybody else is taken or something like that? So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, uh, Karen, this has been fantastic. All of Karen's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. So uh, I I do a lot of things because because I have a lot of places. <laughs> um, but uh, you can find more information for me about me on quant- my website, quantumalignmentsystem.com. I teach a system of personality assessment called human design, and I teach people how to use it as an assessment tool for high performance coaching. So uh, there's a lot of information, uh, blogs, videos, things you can check out there. And of course, you can generate your free human design chart there as well. Fantastic. Well, I would encourage everybody to go uh, go check it out, do it. And uh, 
the, the more information you can give yourself about yourself, I think is always is always very useful, and especially in this in the world that we've just been discussing. So listen, thanks again, Karen. Thank you for watching and listening, and I will see you all again really soon. Thank you. Thank you, John.